Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this lecture series. I feel very honored uh, to give a talk about my work today and also uh, other works that I found really important. Um, the title of my uh, of my uh, yeah, presentation today is Nuanced Perspectives on Sustainable Smart Cities and Communities. My name is Andrea Hamm. Thank you so much for the introduction words. Uh, and luckily, I cannot speak Czech, but um, I will I will give my best to uh, <laughs> to um, yeah to to provide all necessary information about me. Um, so I am a researcher at the Weizenbaum Institute for the Networked Society the German Internet Institute and maybe some more words about myself. Um, so from my background or from training, I have finished a bachelor and master programs in communication and political science. I've studied at uh, Free University Berlin in Germany, the Catholic University of Lille in France and the Free University of Brussels in Belgium. I was a PhD candidate since 2018 to 2021 in computer science at the Technical University Berlin. And uh, I changed the subject and the university in 21, uh, where I finished um, my PhD in digital media and technology at Free University Berlin. And uh, next to my PhD studies, I have a, or I had a researcher position at the Weizenbaum Institute since 2018. Um, back then, I was affiliated with the Technical University Berlin, and I was part of the group Responsibility and the Internet of Things. Um, more recently, uh, last December, I have defended my dissertation with great honors, and currently I am a postdoc um, also at the Weizenbaum Institute in a newly funded research group, uh, which is called Digitalization, Sustainability and Participation. So I'm really happy to meet you today. Um, Maybe some words uh, as some introductory words. Um, so smart city, um, I guess that many of you have already um, uh, to many of you, the term has already occurred. Um, smart city is a major topic of urban development. Um, uh, some researchers coined it as an urban concept where life quality, sustainability, infrastructure and participation of citizens should be improved due to information communication technologies usage. And smart city is also, um, it's not a term that comes from research, it's uh, rather a marketing term and uh, large engineering firms uh, promote um, their system solutions using the term smart city. Um, maybe to give a very short glimpse right now, um, there are so many smart city strategies in the world. Um, I just uh, looked up a little bit in the internet and I saw that uh, Czech Republic also has a smart city cluster and Bruno uh, is actually mentioned as a highlight uh, smart city strategy. Um, and uh, yeah, with regard to such uh, smart city strategies that are published by um, various cities around the world, researchers have um, observed that environmental sustainability is oftentimes underrepresented um, as a perspective um, for the benefit of economic growth and the increase of life quality. So uh, within the smart city term, there is a prioritization of different goals um, and uh, environmental sustainability is sometimes underrepresented. Uh, there are so many other heated debates around the smart city term, um, which leads to a kind of more critical thinking about this term. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, there is a lot of uh, technolo technology enthusiasm, which uh, means that people um, cherish the use of new technologies uh, just for its own sake. and. Um, don't uh, think so much about the impact on people's lives. Um, there is a, a debate about social control, so how digital technologies can be used in urban spaces, but also in uh, neighborhoods or in rural areas to control um, the, social, uh, the social living together um, with the help of data or uh, monitoring. Um, there is a debate about the acceleration of innovation um, there is a broad uh, theory about uh, like a broad innovation theory, which is 
um, also mentioning um, perspectives like uh, move fast and break things uh, with the use of new technologies, which uh, is of course heatedly debated. Uh, surveillance is a major topic um, everywhere where data is collected on people. Uh, people are uh, parts of databases, you can trace them back and um, you, you have a very large um, opportunity of surveillance and then also of control. So there are multiple connections between the different um, uh, debating topics. Sustainable development is another perspective, uh, which is more like a hope or uh, expectation, but also sometimes related to uh, marketing strategies. Um, so the development towards a more sustainable future. And I will uh, elaborate on this um, in particular in the following. Uh, resilience is um, quite similar. So resilience means that um, uh, that cities or communities can react uh, to um, unexpected events um, uh, with the help of uh, technolo technologies. Uh, prosperity is uh, one that connects a lot uh, uh, to the fact of economic growth. So uh, the idea here is that uh, smart cities help the people to uh, receive better jobs, uh, better income, higher incomes, um, better education and lead to a higher socioeconomic status. Um, and finally, uh, and this is just a selection and uh, I, I don't claim uh, complete completeness here, uh, if the efficient resource consumption is uh, another important topic uh, so that digital technologies and smart cities can uh, manage resource consumption much more efficient. Um, so after this very short introduction, I would like to uh, show the agenda for this lecture. I've prepared about an hour um, of contents. Uh, so first I would like to go um, more in depth into the notion of smartness, which is a not very uh, understandable um, term and it's, uh, it's uh, important to take a deeper look at that. Um, even though I guess every one of you uh, has, a, has an idea of what it means. Um, the next uh, next agenda point is the uh, notions of sustainability and sustainable development. Um, afterwards, we will uh, we will merge these concepts to uh, look at smart uh, smart sustainable cities. And uh, afterwards, I have uh, prepared an uh, example of a very recent study of mine um, where I have uh, developed together with colleagues a smart city. Uh, scenario analysis, um, and I would like to show you uh, how uh, how you can conduct uh, one if you are interested. And uh, finally, um, moving a little bit away from uh, well-known or more or more known understandings of smart and sustainable cities and communities, I would like to emphasize a little bit more on civic technologies, so technologies um, that are used for citizens and by citizens, and also looking at uh, journalism uh, opportunities for sustainable cities. Um, as I just mentioned shortly, unfortunately, I cannot see you. Uh, I just see my slides, so um, I cannot see if, if someone raises the hand. And if there is anything, you can just interrupt me um, by audio. So just uh, cut my word, and then I, I will. Uh, I'm happy to to have your question or comment. Okay, then let's go for the first notion, um, smartness. Um, in this part uh, of the talk, I would like to um, present to you a, um, a text uh, from Baikut and Reich, um, 2020, who have um, examined uh, the smartness of cities by uh, looking at smart cities' anticipatory media visions. So uh, how the cities have um, published their visions of the smart city in various media and how it has been reproduced in the local media and how these visions have acted on policy decisions and local implementations uh, since the early 2000s. So in this paper, it's a very interesting comparative historical analysis uh, and fieldwork uh, in aspiring smart cities in the US and in Europe. And um, I will quickly uh, yeah, present it to you or give my best to do that. Um, the findings are that uh, in the notion of smartness um, includes a decisive break uh, from the Cold War notions of centralized control. Um, so the, the idea here is that smartness 
rather elevates resilience and optimization um, above everything else and not so much uh, the control of um, of the of the people of the societies and also societies in other countries. Um, policymakers uh, believe uh, today that smartness can be a pathway to a more interactive and responsive city administration. And I think this is a very interesting point or finding because um, believing is uh, is different from um, from knowing or from from having proven. So this is like uh, this shows how the vision of the smart city is not yet there, but people have high expectations of it and of smartness um, as such um, and what it can uh, do or improve in cities. And uh, once the policymakers have this belief, they are also striving towards it. Um, another very interesting finding is that the smartness term uh, has often been associated with the narrative of crisis. Um, so the authors here found that uh, before 2008, um, the smartness was used as a uh, the smartness as a term was used as an emphasis on sustainability and climate change. Um, maybe you remember um, the um, the film, uh, the movie from El Gore, I think 2001, uh, An Unconvenient Truth, uh, which has made a, a very high media awareness or public awareness on uh, climate change uh, on, and impacts on, uh, on our climate and uh, the planetary boundaries as well. Uh, however, in two, 2008, um, this was the year of one of the largest global economic crises uh, in the world. Uh, and afterwards, the term of smartness was rather used um, uh, together with uh, the, the uses of entrepreneurships and platformization. So here the idea was to cut costs uh, for public administrations and um, and to make the cities more efficient uh, in order to be um, less uh, less money intensive, so less expensive uh, for the administrations. Um, the authors here found that there are divergent paths of uh, smart city initiatives in the US and Europe. Um, in the US, it's mainly big tech companies uh, that are dominating uh, the smartness, uh, smart city initiatives, while in Europe, it is rather the living lab model. So to the construction of um, spaces in the cities uh, where people from different sectors uh, and multi-stakeholders can come together to um, develop something new. Um, but both approaches or paths uh, are characterized by a constant experimenting with data models and real-time information. And the smartness envisions uh, sustainability as the outcome of the continual testing and tweaking of data analysis in city spaces. So it's a rather broad goal, which is not very fixed right now. And But the idea of smartness is that once you play enough with data and you test enough of technology, you will somehow reach sustainability. Um, however, the authors have discussed that urban issues are uh, many times too complicated uh, to be solely managed by technological affordances. And um, there is also the issue that technologies, because they are usually expensive, rather expensive, um, they are kind of embedded in the dominant structures of power and politics. So uh, in cities, it's mainly uh, the city government or uh, very large companies who are located in the cities that are um, running out the, the technologies, the smart uh, technologies. And the second point uh, that is very tricky about smart cities is that they lack universality. Um, so smartness is not easily convertible from one city to another um, and each city launches different uh, visions or objectives. Um, maybe from this first, uh, first part of the presentation on smartness, uh, I have some takeaways. Uh, so I think um, 
what I would like to share is that it's important to investigate the complex relationships uh, between visions of smartness on the one side and the varying down to earth implementations in the build environment on the other side. So sometimes er there is a really big gap on uh, what you can read in a smart city strategy uh, paper with a very nice design of the papers and all the nice things that will happen. And on the other hand, you have the um, the real world scenarios and the, the um, like the limitations of the cities that already exist you cannot you're not f free in space and in time and um, you probably don't have the necessary resources to do everything as you expected and so um, there is sometimes a very big gap uh, so i think it's also important to watch out for the discursive appeal of the techno techno idealism that is oftentimes strongly connected with the term of smartness and um, smartness is an urban vision that has an enduring appeal um, uh, despite it has various shortcomings it uh, shows with a over time historical analysis um, that it's very adaptable to changing social and political economic shifts. So um, as I shortly presented um, the, the time um, around uh, yeah, with the Unconvenient Truths uh, movie um, in, at the beginning when um, there was a lot of uh, debate around sustainability and um, act action against climate change. And afterwards, when the world economic crisis happened, um, it quickly adopted uh, to this changing context. Okay, um, let me quickly check the time. Okay, <laughs> sustainability. Next, uh, next part is sustainability, sustainable development. Um, I don't know how much you have learned so far about the term, so that's I, I would just introduce a little bit from the from the beginning um, to to pick pick you all up. Um, so sustainability is a, a concept that was first defined by the United Nations as a human development that meets uh, present needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, this is a sentence from the Brundtland Commission report from 1987. And it's still quite valid. Um, today, the broad understanding of sustainability uh, also involves a triple bottom line, which is characterized by a responsible resource consumption. So the ecological responsibility uh, part, then there is the economic stability, which is, for example, opposed to the business strategy of move fast and break things. Um, this is the economic sustainability. And third, uh, there is the social balance and inclusiveness, um, which uh, leads to the social sustainability and which has the goal to motivate people to participate in the city transformation and not being passive ob observers. Um, sustainability is regarded as a normative concept. Um, so here's, for example, a quote from Harrington. Uh, the quest for sustainability involves connecting what is known through scientific study to applications in pursuit of what people want for the future. And this is a very important point. So what people want for the future is, uh, is a kind of tricky part because people are so diverse and different. Uh, if you just look at the um, political uh, political uh, diversity, uh, what political goals people are striving for, or voting for. Um, probably uh, not even in this uh, hybrid room here in this lecture, we can like all of us can agree on what is sustainability in detail, um, though we all agree on the on the broad concept probably. Um, I have uh, also um, listed some more points that are made by Harrington. Uh, so the meanings of sustainability include a couple of more points. The first one is that choices matter. So according to her, it's not possible to sustain everything everywhere forever. So we have to decide um, where we want to have sustainability and for how long and um, and for what exactly. It's also a fuzzy concept, uh, but in a positive sense. Uh, so that means that the goal, sustainability is merely a goal, and this is the most important, and it's less important which approach or means is applied to uh, get there. And this directly leads to um, the characteristic that sustainability connects 
with other essential concepts. Uh, so it's uh, very easy to, um, yeah, to include concepts like resilience, adaptive capacity, and vulnerability. Um, additionally, uh, she's, Harrington says that scale matters, uh, so in time and space and also the place matters. Um, if you have uh, a very, one very sustainable city, for example, it doesn't help uh, to reach the sustainable development goal uh, for the whole, uh, for, for the world population. Um, you need to, you need to, sorry, <laughs> just people in front of the door. <laughs> uh, you, you need to reach out to other cities and to the whole country. And uh, you also have to make sure that it's sustainable over time um, and not just a short term project. Um, and uh, finally, there are limits that exist. Uh, so, for example, the planetary boundaries are. Um, ich habe gerade eine Vorlesung. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, the planetary boundaries exist, uh, and they cannot be um, shifted uh, anywhere else. We just have one Earth. Okay, moving on to sustainable development. Uh, sustainable development is a term that is uh, oftentimes used as a synonym uh, for sustainability. However, it is, uh, it is not the goal, it is the process of social advancement that accommodates the needs of current and future generations and that successfully integrates economic, social and environmental considerations in decision making. Um, you have pro you probably know um, the sustainable development goals, which have been rolled out in 2015. Uh, here you see uh, uh, yeah, the famous icons um, in the lower part of the slide. Uh, this collection of 17 interlinked uh, objectives is designed to serve as a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. Um, Nevertheless, you can criticize uh, the sustainable development goals um, as they, for example, do not prioritize uh, on environmental protection, um, even though the climate crisis would ask for uh, such a priori priori prioritization. Um, and another uh, criticism is that the sustainable development goals remain fixated on the idea that economic growth is uh, foundational to achieve all pillars of sustainable development. And uh, some scholars say that um, the, yeah, we, we need another economic logic uh, in order to, um, to achieve sustainable development because economic growth is actually um, a counterpower towards sustainable development, or would be. Um, in the end, um, as Martinez Fernandez uh, stated, uh, the sustainable development will depend on the tangible outcomes of the policy initiatives. So this is mainly a policy initiatives, and um, it's important to achieve bringing together civil society actors, businesses, academia, municipal legislators around a shared common vision of development. Um, so once all uh, stakeholders are uh, included, um, this could be uh, the way to a tangible outcome. Uh, now moving on a little bit uh, to merging the terms smart and sustainable. Um, the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, has uh, published in 2014 a standard for smart, sustainable cities. Um, this is a norming institute uh, in the telecommunications sector, and uh, it's kind of a guideline for uh, development and for businesses. And uh, in 2014, they have emphasized um, the following characteristics, so the quality of life of its citizens, economic growth and employment, the well-being of its citizens, environmentally responsible and sustainable approaches, the streamlining of the physical infrastructure, resilience, effective and well-balanced regulatory compliance and governance mechanisms. Um, additionally, to uh, the standard, uh, we have, uh, yeah, as mentioned previously, uh, the sustainable development goals. And the goal 11 uh, is particularly directed to um, sustainable cities and communities. 
Um, as all goals uh, include targets and indicators, so there is a long, longer list of targets and indicators. Um, also, uh, the goal 11 has uh, some, and one of them is uh, the target 11.1 which says uh, by 2030, ensure access for all to adequate, safe and affordable housing and basic services and upgrade slums. And the indicator for this target is 11.1.1, uh, the proportion of urban population living in slums in formal settlements or inadequate housing. So um, this uh, SDG 11 target one um, works like um, the measurement of this proportion of the urban population living in slums uh, in informal settlements or inadequate housing, and you can have over time then uh, uh, development. So um, if the proportion is uh, uh, shrinking or uh, increasing. Um, now I would like to move on uh, to the sustainable smart cities and communities as a discourse and I would like to show you the scenario analysis tool afterwards. Um, the discourse uh, and just as a, as a uh, short um, uh, help for the memory discourse as a system of thought, knowledge or communication that constructs our experience of the world is a concept uh, that um, came from the pioneering work by Michel Foucault. And I think discourse um, yeah, connects very well to the uh, to the events and um, and uh, discussions around sustainable smart cities and communities because there are so many conflicting claims and um, when you just uh, google it you you reach yeah you have so many different perspectives and it's really complicated to pin down uh, the smart city as a unifying paradigm and uh, there are very many ambivalent ideas and visions that uh, generate actions that implicate sustainable development to varying degrees. Um, what I would like to uh, show you today is uh, another text that I found very helpful in the smart city field. Uh, so uh, De Waal and Dignum in 2017 have conducted the smart city discourse analysis and they found uh, three major scenarios in the different texts. Um, so the first one is the control room scenario, which basically relates to the city management, um, the basic infrastructure management, the consumption and the public services. The control room scenario is mainly government driven. Um, the second one is the creative city scenario, which envisages uh, smart cities as hubs for technological innovation. This one is economy driven um, scenario. And the third one is the smart citizen scenario, which describes how civil society uses technology to mobilize for collective ideas. And this one is um, mainly citizen driven. And just have a water. <laughs> So this um, table you see here um, it was uh, yeah was um, made by uh, by me and my colleagues um, to show uh, from this discourse analysis by Deval and Dignum the different chances and risks that appear together with the control room, the creative city, and the smart citizen scenarios. Um, so I can. Uh, maybe, yeah, we have time to go through them a little bit. Uh, so the chances of the control room um, are, of course, that through the monitoring of, uh, of city processes, you can uh, reach uh, optimization of the processes. You can see where you lose uh, energy or where you can uh, save costs, for example. This goes through all um, sectors of the city from transport to safety to energy provision. However, you have here the risks of uh, privacy infractions um, as you install uh, certain technologies, uh, monitoring tools in the public space or in the consumption behavior of the residents. Uh, you can probably trace back uh, private information. Um, there's also the risk of black box applications. Uh, so black box means that you uh, you probably have a kind of invisible device. There are small devices uh, included in public spaces or in uh, buildings, and you don't know what they're doing. They probably maybe have a camera or some sensors, but there is no um, 
no information about what what kind of data is collected, where it's sent to, and what happens afterwards. Um, the the control room can also lead to a manifestation of power structures, so that the already powerful uh, governments or already powerful companies in the in the city or in the community uh, can become even more powerful with the knowledge uh, that they gain from the data and uh, people are even more uh, or the city is maybe even more dependent on uh, on these actors um, paternalism is another risk it means that um, uh, that people decide uh, what is best for you without asking you uh, so um, for example uh, yeah to take a very easy example um, bus routes are constructed through the city in a way uh, that um, certain um, certain nice residential areas are uh, are connected very well to to other parts of the city and others are not and uh, people in, in um, higher positions think that it, it should be like that and uh, these people should use more buses and the other ones should uh, use less buses for example and um, yeah nudging is uh, is actually the description of the tech of the technique um, how uh, behavioral changes can be um, yeah can, can be um, conducted or um, uh, encouraged. And the second one is the creative city scenario. Um, the chances here are uh, to increase the local economy, um, to have higher education levels uh, among society, uh, to have a more modern administration and regulation, to strive for uh, sustainability, to have a thriving culture, inclusion and social equity, and citizens are regarded as co-creators in the innovation process of the creative city. So um, risks here are that you have a, a kind of polarization because um, not everybody has the skills or the uh, the context or the socio-economical background uh, to participate in creative city scenarios. Um, rather others have them and uh, this leads to a, a kind of social fragmentation that some people um, who have the skills uh, they can participate and others are uh, kind of excluded and this can also lead to a growing inequality um, that some uh, city areas are um, much more uh, much more nice to live in and they have much better jobs and other uh, areas are um, less developed um, and this inequality can also lead to disciplinary strategies so um, uh, yeah examples are that if people are not part of the creative city uh, development um, they can get disadvantages for example um, in uh, yeah in other in, in other uh, parts of the life um, the smart city, uh, smart citizen scenario, the third one, um, is rather looking at uh, citizen-driven approaches. So uh, ideas to revolutionize the local government, for example, with uh, new apps uh, or with uh, new um, new ways of uh, participating in uh, in government, uh, making it more responsive, transparent, and cost-effective. Uh, however, here are also several risks, uh, for example, that governments outsource the responsibility to um, uh, to make the city smarter and more sustainable to uh, citizens. And um, at the same time, citizenship here is solely understood in terms of efficiency. So if you are part of the uh, smart citizen, uh, initiatives or not. And um, additionally, uh, here's a problem of legitimization um, because uh, the digitally skilled people uh, design here the citizen applications for all people. And uh, of course, those people have not been voted or um, got any other le legitimated um, uh, yeah, task. Um, so having this big table in mind with all the risks and the chances, um, I would like to show you now uh, how we have developed the smart city scenario analysis. Um, and this has actually uh, been, uh, this will be published uh, very soon um, as a book chapter. Um, so maybe quickly one slide to the research that we did here. Um, we had the goal of the research to better understand 
how smart cities are interpreted in practice in Japan and Germany. And we conducted a case study with on the ground tours and conversations with local actors. Um, we selected two cases of smart city locations um, that are that show highly developed uh, smart cities uh, or smart city initiatives in Germany and Japan, and which prominently incorporate uh, sustainability transition elements. So in Cologne, uh, we found an interesting case uh, in Germany, in Cologne, um, which applies a test bed called Klimastraße, or in English it's Climate Street, um, already since 2013-14. And in Japan, um, we found the case of Kashi Wanoha, which had the first objective of an eco-friendly urban development. Um, unfortunately, I cannot talk so much about Kashi Wanoha here because we don't have so much time. I would just show some examples from the Cologne case, but if you're interested, I'm happy to share um, uh, the book chapter afterwards. Um, so the data we looked at was the diary data from visiting tours, photo reporting data and online sources and materials. And we developed from, uh, we analyzed uh, this data um, based on the smart city discourse analysis findings, what I just presented uh, before. And uh, with this analytical scheme, uh, this large table that you just saw um, in terms of a smart city scenario analysis. So maybe some words to Cologne. Um, Cologne is an example of a smart city development uh, in Germany. Um, the city of Cologne is marked by a long history and the post-World War II reconstruction. There are conflicting structural demands and system legacies. So there is very old, um, there are very old buildings uh, and also protected buildings in the city. Um, and of course, uh, since the World War, there have been uh, constructions of many, many different buildings for many different purposes. And the uh, smart city strategy has now uh, the challenge to integrate new technologies in this legacy systems and buildings. Um, in Smart City Cologne, there is a focus on energy. Um, the initiative here is led by the city of Cologne together with a local energy provider called Rhein Energy. Rhein Energy. Um, they have, for example, set up several plug-in charging stations for electric cars and bicycles in the city, and they also um, started to change the public lightning installation uh, from traditional lights uh, to LEDs uh, for less energy consumption. Um, very interesting here is the experimental space called Climate Street. Um, this street here in Cologne uh, is representative, uh, quite representative for the Cologne population and new projects are tested in this street first before they are rolled out in the whole city. Uh, so, for example, uh, they tested the solar power device charging station for passerbys, uh, for passersby, which you see here on the on the photos. Um, they rolled out a free Wi-Fi uh, several years ago, and they also conducted tests of smart home and smart meters for local businesses in the street. Um, they also had a lottery uh, for improvements of building insulation, so they improved the um, the actual walls of the buildings um, to uh, save heating costs in winter and also to keep the places cooler in, in summer. And they uh, measured uh, how much it helps for sustainable uh, development in terms of um, decreasing energy consumption. Very interesting is also the camera supported and privacy conformed surveillance of parking spaces, um, which connects uh, an app for drivers and public LED displays attached to public lights. So you see here on the photo that there are cameras uh, on top of parking spaces and they uh, do not save the photos uh, that are taken here. So this is a photo taken by us, um, the lower one. Um, and they, for example, they don't collect data of the number plates or something. They just uh, calculate how many free spaces they have. And this information is then sent to the app and there is no um, uh, yeah, no, no uh, saving of private information, which cars and uh, how long they have been there. So it's only the parking information that is uh, saved here and transmitted. Um, also very interesting is the civic engagement in Cologne. There is a festival organized by engaged citizens um, with the goal to promote the awareness of energy uh, consumption and uh, uh, to raise awareness of energy consumption and promoting the energy saving measures in the district. 
Um, so people are gathering and um, organizing a festival here with music and games. Um, also, what is really interesting is that there is a support of non-digital smart city projects. So in Cologne, we found that smart is not necessarily digital. And if a co project contributes to a particular urban issue, it is welcome to be part of the smart city network um, that is uh, ma uh, maintained by the Rhein Energy uh, provider and the city. Uh, for example, a Honey Connection um, seeks to create habitats for bees in the city, and here on the photos you see uh, some actions uh, of them. Um, yeah, maybe I skip that one and move on to how we use the scenario analysis. Uh, so here you see uh, in orange and in green um, the points that we found in uh, in Cologne, and you here you see that we only found uh, characteristics of the control room scenario and of the smart citizen scenario. We couldn't find any characteristics of creative city scenario. And uh, among the risks and the chances, you see also the grayed out ones, um, which we have not observed, and the colorful ones, which we have observed. And uh, so this is a tool. We use this uh, table as well as an analysis tool for the Kashiwa case, the Japanese one. And it actually allows to compare uh, different smart city uh, initiatives um, all over the world. And it uh, also helps to maintain a critical thinking about the risks and the chances, which are always um, appearing more or less together. Um, now for the last part of the of the session, I would like to um, move a little bit further uh, from the from the broader conceptions of smart cities, smart sustainable cities and communities towards uh, civic technologies and also towards uh, journalism for sustainable cities. Um, so civic tech um, is a quite uh, yeah, more or less arbitrarily used uh, term. Um, here I've brought uh, two definitions. Uh, civic tech are technologies developed by nonprofits, companies, or governments themselves, trying to make it easier for citizens to engage with their governments. Um, or the second one is uh, that civic tech are technological tools that promote, facilitate, or coordinate civic actions. Um, so both of them are quite different. And uh, in this figure, I have uh, copied a, a very early understanding of civic tech, uh, which has been published by the Knight Foundation in 2013. And here you can see basically um, many, ma uh, yeah, many uh, ways of working together digitally um, towards a common goal. So, uh, for example, towards uh, collaborative consumptions, tools for procuring paid services from local vendors and sharing of corporate owned assets. There is crowdfunding, so the funding for consumer and commercial products, um, social networks for virtual professional or practice based networks, community organizing, um, the political campaign management tools or the government data, uh, internal performance and anal analytics software. Um, I think there is no uh, common definition of civic tech and um, there are also many related concepts. Uh, however, it's it's very useful to look at uh, civic tech and the related concepts uh, when talking about smart and sustainable cities and communities. Um, so other related concepts are the citizen sourcing, which has a focus on people's mass contribution related to public problems and political decision making. Um, the term citizen science refers to the voluntarily collection and or processing of data by non-scientists and as a part of scientific inquiry. And third, uh, the citizen sensing, which is used in context of environmental data collection and carried out by citizens. Um, so here you see these related concepts are more or less um, a public data collection and processing that is initiated by citizens. Um, and not, uh, yeah, not not directed towards citizens. Um, now, with this concept of civic tech in mind, I would like to move on to uh, uh, observation that I've made in, in Germany. Um, uh, something that is called the journalism of things, um, and which I see also 
tightly connected to uh, to to initiatives of uh, smart and sustainable cities. So um, here we we have a group of German journalists uh, who have founded the Journalism of Things as a new paradigm for journalism in increasingly networked societies. And uh, the community signed, for example, the manifesto, which you can find on uh, GitHub uh, in 2019. Uh, and based on this manifesto, they regularly organize a conference, a Journalism of Things conference. Um, the yeah they won journalism awards and uh, show kind of um, pioneer journalism examples which are providing models or imaginaries of new possibilities um, i have now three examples um, to show you how uh, journalistic projects can be part of uh, smart city transition uh, processes or smart, smart sustainable uh, city pr processes. So the first one is um, called Radmesser or in English it's more uh, bicycle meter. Um, in this project, uh, journalists and, um, and the community has measured overtaking distances between cyclists and cars. Um, so on the right side you see a map of Berlin um, with a coloration of uh, the streets and then the red the red uh, colored streets are more dangerous in terms of um, riding the bicycle because of being very closely overtaken by cars and the blue ones are more safe um, so the output of this um, of, of this project was this interactive web application um, uh, which explained the project from the start uh, to the to the end with a photo story. Um, they published this data map um, and several related media articles and they uh, gave public talks about their project. Um, Tagesspiegel is a local news medium based in Berlin. It was um, a coordinated the coordinating coordinating medium. Um, and in the uh, Radmesser uh, example, uh, it was a co-creative team with two physicists and several journalists um, who, um, who worked together uh, with 100 volunteers who collected the data for two months. Um, so the motivation of this project was um, the experimentation. So the physicists uh, told me um, that it was interesting for them to just think about a sensing device, if it's possible to measure overtaking distances, because such a device did not exist before and they um, developed it and tested it uh, and built a true prototype. Um, for the journalists, it was rather the motivation to work on a highly relevant topic of cy cycling safety. Uh, which is part of the uh, of the mobility transformation um, to use less cars and more uh, bicycles and also the lack of data was a motivation. Um, so they conducted uh, the project by planning a journalistic story around this project, uh, the construction, the testing of a new sensor device and the creation of a community of volunteers and recipients. Um, after the story, which is very interesting, um, there was a change of the German traffic regulation. So they adopted uh, a uh, 1.5 meter rule for overtaking maneuvers in urban spaces, which has not been written uh, before. Um, also, after the story, there was a legal reuse uh, of the data um, in the case of pop-up pop cycling lanes. So uh, during the pandemic, um, uh, suddenly there were uh, the districts in Berlin, they created so-called pop-up cycling lanes, um, which kind of um, maintained uh, more um, distance between uh, cars and cyclists. Um, and those have been uh, claimed as illegal, but then during the case, um, this data of overtaking maneuvers has been reused to, um, yeah, to, to uh, solve the case. Um, the next topic, uh, journalism of things uh, case that I would like to show you is called Bean and Life or Bees Life in English. Uh, in this project, journalists have equipped uh, beehives uh, for six months uh, with, with different sensors and a camera um, to monitor their activities. Um, the output of this um, sensor journalistic project was um, a personalized WhatsApp story by the queen bees uh, so readers got um, automated messages uh, by the 
by the bees, um, for example, messages like, oh, today it's really hot, uh, 30 degrees in summer, um, it's really hard to produce honey today. Um, so the readers could actually uh, feel uh, empathetic with the bees, uh, with the bee populations. And uh, connected to these sensor-based uh, news, uh, the journalists shared um, uh, shared uh, like more, more info information and materials uh, on bee lives, how to create bee-friendly gardens and uh, balconies, for example. Um, the story was produced by the German uh, broadcaster, public broadcaster WDR, um, West German uh, radio station, and the journalism startup Tactile News. Um, the motivation here of the journalists was to cover the well-known problem insect mortality uh, to raise people's awareness on the topic. And they said that usually it's very hard to cover a topic like insect mortality because everybody knows that it's existing and people should do something against it, but it's it has no news value uh, per se. And you have to think about how to uh, constantly um, yeah, create news about insect mortality. Um, so the journalists constructed and tested uh, diverse uh, sensor devices and cameras. They collaborated with volunteer beekeepers and prepared a journalistic output and mes messenger communication. Um, the result of this project was the creation of a bee-friendly reader community. Uh, so the community was increasing, um, continuously increasing. However, the project was only uh, six months uh, for six months and. Uh, Afterwards, it was over. Um, however, the journalists reported that there have been seemingly behavioral changes on the recipient site. So people posted, for example, on WhatsApp uh, photos of their bee-friendly gardens, which they have uh, changed after having received so many news about bees and their lives. Um, the third and last um, uh, project I would like to show you, or Journalism of Things case study, is called Feinstaubradar, or it's uh, in English uh, fine dust radar or particulate matter uh, radar. And this has been conducted by the Stuttgarter Zeitung, so the newspaper located in Stuttgart city, um, which started to use uh, open data on particulate matter pollution, which is generated by a civic IoT initiative called Luftdaten Info. Um, and they used this open data to create this data map, which you see on the right side, and also to um, automatically generate computer art, uh, computer written articles. Um, the motivation of this project was to provide uh, data on a much debated regional topic. So air pollution was already a heatedly debated topic before this uh, project started. And um, they conducted this project by participating in the civic tech community events. And uh, then they developed together with a local IT company a secondary data map, um, so a different one from the civic IoT initiative, which would then better comply to the medium's uh, information quality standards. The result, uh, which you see here, is a regional information service on air pollution based on a data map, um, which is freely uh, available and browser-based, um, and they provide the information for a broader audience. So not just the people uh, who know about the Civic IoT initiative, the Luftdaten Info, but also the uh, older and less tech um, savvy readers of the Stuttgart Zeitung, which is a traditional medium in the city, um, can receive this information. Um, the potential here is that uh, a broader public receives information than uh, before, so the use of the open data and the publication to a broader public is a potential, and also that the journalism mediates uh, the heated debate on citizen science and low-cost sensors, because this was uh, highly relevant in, in Stuttgart. Um, okay, uh, taking a look at the time uh, for more minutes, so time for a wrap up. Um, yeah, what you have uh, heard so far is um, that uh, sustainability can probably be um, summarized uh, very well as rather a goal uh, or a vision 
uh, whereas uh, smartness instead is rather a tool. So smartness is not a goal or um, or uh, something that should be achieved for its own sake. Um, it should have another uh, goal. Um, smartness, however, is a tricky concept which sells uh, well. However, smart does not mean to be digital, as we have seen in the Cologne case. And I would also argue for an understanding of smartness, which is, does not only mean digital. Um, sustainability, however, appears to be, uh, at the first glance, an easily understandable concept. However, it includes numerous meanings and expectations that are mingled under the term, and it's highly complex to working towards sustainability. Um, at the same time, sub-goals of sustainability are often contradicting. Um, and finally, uh, what you just saw in the last part of the presentation, um, I see journalism uh, as a potential change agent uh, in smart, sustainable cities and communities. And I think it's uh, very interesting to look at journalistic projects that are tackling uh, issues or challenges uh, towards the sustainability transformation goal with the help of smart, uh, maybe digital, but not necessarily digital um, tools. Okay, and now thank you for listening. Uh, I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Andrea. It was really interesting, many new interesting ideas. So thank you for that. And are there questions? Okay, it looks like no questions for now. Maybe someone will uh, think about something. So far, I would like to ask you a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, that sustainability is something what we have to think about mostly as a vision or goal. Uh, and my question is, how achievable is this goal actually? Or uh, how far are we are we from the moment where we can say, uh, okay, be like a sustainable society or sustainable city? Yeah, that's a very very good question. Um, I think it's actually not not possible to to reply to it um, just like, like in in a general way. I think it's it really depends on. Um, what you like yeah what is your own perspective on sustainability and uh, and how um how we can yeah how we can merge i think one of the first parts that we have to work on is to to reach uh, to a common vision uh, of sustainability and then um it's uh, it's somehow uh, not easy to to um, to define the limits because uh, you, you you need to merge different stakeholders or different societal actors to to define um, but that on the other hand you you need like the experts and all the different societal uh, sectors and um, and uh, yeah to 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 really have a meaningful output so it doesn't help to stay on a theoretical level uh, as researchers are usually doing that at, at least in the social science or political science um, field it, it, in the end it's really about the applications and about how to achieve it um, and uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's not easy to uh, yeah to, to answer to this question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, anyway, um, maybe I will follow up with another one, which was actually bugging me from the beginning of the presentation. Uh, since uh, uh, I think currently what is discussed a lot is our ethical aspects of AI, mostly, but also in technologies in general. So, my, uh, and you mentioned also some aspects, uh, some negative aspects of smart cities like social control. Uh, so, uh, I would like to ask if you could maybe elaborate a little bit about ethical aspects of smart cities. What are the risks? What are the opportunities in this? Yes, yes, I'm I'm happy to do so. Yeah, I think 
ethical aspects are like very important uh, in in the smart city initiatives or in in the uh, in the actions that are uh, taken here. Um, and I think it's it should be up for discussion um, which parts of uh, of the city and of the public space are actually or should be made available for um, data capturing and uh, data analysis. Um, so I think uh, that sometimes. Um, Applications are just rolled out uh, in in uh, yeah in, in particular ways, and then they don't work very well. And sometimes they have to be uh, they have to be um, removed again. Um, and that's uh, yeah, it's I think ethical aspects are, for example, that you you should um, be careful about uh, the the surveillance of particular neighborhoods. Uh, I mean, there are there are so many things like stalking or uh, tracing uh, private data from families, from children, um, from yeah, fr fr from individuals which you can trace down. Um, and uh, or in, in the on the other side, it's also the uh, neglection of some topics. So if you focus a lot on uh, mobility, for example, like in the Cologne case, uh, you have this uh, strong focus on e-electronic cars and uh, electronic uh, bicycles. But um, who is uh, checking the the actually the actual roads and the, the infrastructure? If it's uh, even possible to ride everywhere with a bicycle, for example. And I think sometimes um, smart city strategies can. Uh, also avoid talking about other important things because they have this focus on um, the use of technology. Um, but sometimes uh, cities have other issues. Um, for example, in rural areas, you don't need an application um, for the, for, you don't need a mobility application, which tells you when does the bus come if you only have two buses a day. Um, so that was an example from one uh, person that I met from a rural area here in Germany. And But people are actually uh, working on uh, these mobility apps for rural areas, but sometimes it's just like the real need for people needs to be in the center. And uh, so what do people need and what really needs to be improved? It's not about um, making cities or communities uh, smart just for the sake of making them smart. Thank you so much. That's really important. I agree with you. Uh, there are actually two new questions in chat. I will, uh, okay, I will just read them for you. The first one first. Uh, I'm not sure if I catch the part about data collection for the discourse analysis of smart cities in Germany and Japan. Can you describe that? Do you conducted some sort of complex problem mapping and visioning with the city's government and citizens? Oh, sorry. Can you repeat the question? I, 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 I luckily I cannot see the chat to read it by myself. Okay, uh, it has two parts, so maybe I'll, yeah. first, I'll uh, read the, the first part. Thank uh, you. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if I catch the part about data collection for the discourse analysis on smart cities in Germany and Japan. Can you describe that? This data collection. How did you collect the data? Uh, ah, the you mean in, in this particular study uh, that lead yeah, to yeah. the uh, analysis uh, scheme? Yeah, um, yeah. So we actually uh, before the pandemic, uh, I was traveling uh, to Japan uh, together with a Japanese colleague, uh, and we visited the Kashiwa smart city case uh, on the ground, and we had a meeting with. Uh, city official and we uh, did interview and a visiting tour on the place and we took a lot of um, notes like diary data based um, notes and we also um, noted uh, yeah yeah we took notes during the interviews and um, uh, and we did the same in Cologne then. So half a year later, uh, my Japanese colleague uh, visited Germany and we traveled to Cologne and we also met uh, a city official who showed us around and we took the photos there and um, yeah and then afterwards we were thinking about uh, how we can make sense of this data and how we can usefully compare it and then we came up uh, or we we, uh, we found this discourse analysis uh, that I showed in the in the slides and we um, made this table of all the different characteristics of smart cities um, uh, yeah, distinguishing the risks and the chances at the same time. 
And uh, um, yeah, and so we made those two cases comparable. But still, we are, of course, discussing that uh, you have very different local contexts and um, different cultures, different languages, uh, different economic situations. Um, and of course, the, the, these are limitations of the study. Um, but still, I think uh, it's it's a useful tool um, to to get a um, like a more general understanding where emphasis are put in different contexts. And um, yeah, I'm I'm sorry that I couldn't present the Japanese case as well. <laughs> Is this methodology actually replicable? In case we would like to, you know, apply it to Czech cities, for example. Yes, yes, I, I, I uh, yeah, I would like to encourage uh, actually uh, to to reuse this methodology. So it's it's basically this table that you saw um, uh, on the slides, and you uh, you just um, go into your data then and uh, think about the different risks and uh, chances that you have observed or not observed, and then you can. Uh, of course, describe in a longer text why you have observed this and why you haven't observed the other one. But in the end, you have these tables um, with the observed uh, characteristics and the non-observed, and you could, can put different cities next to each other, and uh, you can compare them and uh, make conclusions um, afterwards. And um, this is going to be published in the book chapter you're preparing or it has been published already somewhere? Not yet, unfortunately, but if you're interested, I'm happy to share the preprint. Uh, the book chapter is still in production, um, so I'm I, I mean, I'm, I'm done with all the reviews and uh, revisions, um, but it's uh, yeah, it's a long process with the book. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you. So there's the next question, which actually relates to uh, digital divide. Uh, I will just read it all again. Yes. Even if smart city, uh, smart does not necessarily mean digital, it happens quite a lot. How do you think that older people or people with lower digital competencies will cope with that? In a sense of digitalizing the tickets for public transportation, prescriptions on drugs and so on. I think that this can be quite troubling. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I think that's also a very important uh, point, and it actually shows a kind of contradiction between the different sustainability goals, um, because making, uh, for example, mobility or, or public services, uh, as the, it was mentioned in the question, more accessible and more easily accessible, more convenient for uh, yeah, I, I just say the mainstream of the people, um, it always excludes um, other people who don't have the access uh, by default. Also, you can think about the language, um, like people who don't know, uh, like the official language then, and, and or people who, who don't have sight, uh, who cannot see, um, they are also like uh, largely excluded with many smartphone applications. And um, yeah, I, I just uh, I can just uh, reply in terms of a, a rather good example that I heard of from Finland, um, who are uh, having this kind of citizen um, citizen points in in the urban space where uh, all online applications are available together with a person who is working there and. You can talk to the person and the, the, the person is your interface then because the person is using the computer with all the um, digital uh, digital tools. Um, so, for example, you can buy uh, tickets there or you can um, register your new address there and uh, you don't have to use your own computer. Or you don't need a computer. You can just go there and tell these people um, to to do your uh, to, to do the public uh, service for you. And I think that might be an option. Of course, it's also more uh, expensive because you need uh, again like a like a second infrastructure. You don't you you not only have the online interface and your website, your official city website with all the information. You also need a, a like a location, like an office in the city to um, provide uh, the service. But I think. Um, for uh, yeah, to, to avoid exclusion and to avoid losing uh, whole groups of people like elderly or digital unskilled people without sight, um, uh, it's it's absolutely necessary um, to think 
uh, for these groups at the same time. So, yeah. Another question. What do you personally think is the best approach to meet sustainability goals in European cities? Oh, can you repeat? Sorry, there was a gap. Uh, what do you personally think is the best approach to meet sustainability goals in European cities? <laughs> yeah, very good question. Um, I think it's it's super hard to say what is the best approach. Um, I think I think it's really important uh, right now to have a kind of a uh, critical view of um, of this concept of smartness uh, what i what i mentioned in the beginning um that it's yeah for there is a lot of uh, marketing uh, logic in there and um a lot of uh, ideas of yeah we can make it possible like the solutionism uh, you have a problem we have a solution uh, you can just uh, buy it uh, and we will make it possible and i think it's the most important is in in europe but all over the world actually to to be skeptical about these promises um to be skeptical about the expectations um, to be very aware of the complexity of the urban processes and um, also the varying needs and the the um, the different perspectives of people and um, I think most important is to keep the process open so to not uh, leave it to a small group of experts um, to to keep it open for participation also to invite uh, participation in a more active way so not just um uh publishing uh like an invitation for for citizen participations on, on some website but to uh, to roll out a campaign uh, even if it's expensive um to attract people to to be part of uh, the transformation and uh, i think there is no best approach i think it's uh it's impossible to to make this uh kind of um yeah, th this evaluation and cities are so different. Um, also, the yeah locations are so different. Rural areas are, have have so many other needs than cities and uh, small cities and big cities. And um, yeah, there are very rich cities. There are poorer cities with uh, yeah. It's a, yeah, I think it's um, yeah, it's super complex. But it's a very good question, and uh, I think it's important to to be aware of the. Uh, yeah, of the of the issues and of the complexity. Okay, thank you for an answer. Uh, there is another question. Uh, you mentioned journalism towards imaginaries of new possibilities. Is that a reference to Dan Lockton's imaginary slot and the new metaphors project? Oh, sorry, I didn't get that. Can could you repeat? Okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, no problem. Uh, you mentioned journalism that awards imaginaries of new possibilities. Is that yes. a reference to Dan Lockton's imaginary slab and the new metaphors project? Uh, can you repeat the author name? Dan Lockton's. Dan Lockton. Dan Lockton. Uh, no, so, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think so. No, I, at least I, I, I don't recognize this, uh, her, her name now. Um, uh, so this uh, imaginaries of new possibilities is a quote from a journalism researcher uh, from the University of Bremen, um, Andreas Hepp, and uh, he was, uh, yeah, pre prior to my work, he was thinking about how journalism is actually um, being transformed uh, within this, uh, yeah, in this increasing uh, digitalization of our societies and um, yeah, I, I think this journalism of things, what I was studying in my uh, in, in my doctoral thesis um, was uh, very well connecting to to his thought. But I, I would be happy to know to know more about the, the other author's uh, concept on uh, new imaginaries, uh, imaginaries of new possibilities. I can rewrite it for you later. Uh, okay, thank you for explanation. Um, there are not currently more questions, so if there are any more, just feel free to ask them or write them. Meanwhile, maybe 
I will ask one last question for me because I just wrote a bunch of my notes here. <laughs> So uh, it's a question which actually I like to ask everyone because we are librarians, obviously. So uh, how would you see a role of library in a sustainable or smart or sustainable smart city? What What's their role there? What do they do? What can they do? Did you, did you get that? Did you hear the question? Yeah, you, is is a question for me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is you mean the library, uh, like the library in the public universities libraries. or public libraries? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I though. So, yeah, I can. I can just uh, say what comes to my mind now because I I, I have not yet uh, studied libraries um, as uh, public infrastructures, but I think. Um, Today, libraries still have a kind of role of um, like maybe two, two I, I see two points. Um, so the first one is uh, like a resilient structure of uh, knowledge, uh, of saving knowledge in terms of a non-digital database. So I'm, I'm talking about the actual places where books and um, and uh, magazines, for example, are stored or also uh, video DVDs and videos. So you have a kind of um, non-digital and hence resilient uh, backup infrastructure of the knowledge uh, when it comes to uh, losing digital data, for example, um, and major digital libraries uh, lo losing the data or, um, or, for example, being hacked or something like that. Um, and a second one that I see is that libraries are still a, a point of uh, meeting other people um, in terms of uh, using uh, using areas of uh, group works in libraries or um, just uh, meeting people in front of the libraries uh, who are interested. So I think there is a um, the possibility to uh, to to use libraries in uh, um, new kind of sense of uh, having in-person meetings, which uh, is uh, different from from meeting in the virtual space. For example, in Berlin uh, now with the um, uh, with the uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't call it maybe energy crisis, but as you know, um, uh, there there is uh, the the big criticism uh, and and the issue in Germany that we are uh, that we are so dependent on uh, gas uh, from from Russia or we have been and um, now the gas supply has been reduced a lot and Germans are. Um, uh, told to uh, to reduce their energy consumption in order to get through the winter this winter and next winter and uh, actually in Berlin the libraries uh, now had an initiative um, of uh, public warmth uh, so they uh, called it uh, um, let's meet and uh, be warm together so they actually extended their uh, opening hours now during the winter time uh, and invited people who cannot afford uh, to um, turn on the heating in their apartments uh, very much because it's uh, very expensive right now. Um, uh, and uh, and the, they invited people to go to the libraries and meet there and stay warm together. And I found that's a very nice initiative, um, which is also very smart um, and helps people to go, uh, to, yeah, to, to, um, yeah, to overcome this um, harder times. Meanwhile, there is a new question for you from chat. I will read yes. it for you again. I would like to ask if the possible negative consequences of creative cities, such as polarization, division of society, can really be taken as negative consequences of creative cities since society is even without smart cities naturally divided and polarized in things like work, uh, participating in shaping society and so on. Uh, yeah, I hope I got the question right. Uh, maybe I can answer or reply to that with an example um, from uh, Canada. Uh, there was the um, the idea of uh, Google Sidewalk Labs um, to create a new 
uh, a new district of the of the city uh, in in Toronto. Um, there was a new area uh, next to the harbor. Uh, I think it was called Waterfront. Toronto waterfront, or I have to look it up again. But um, uh, there was a was a huge debate on uh, if an IT company or a, um, like a, a yeah advertising online advertising company, uh, what Google uh, basically is, um, what is making money uh, from, um, can really build a city district and. Um, so they uh, constructed together with, uh, they, they created together with architects very nice plans, uh, how buildings, living and working has been constructed in the city. And they, um, of course, they wanted to move several uh, offices there and uh, related uh, companies to the IT sector. And, uh, and but the, actually the whole project after several years of uh, planning and of uh, campaigning for it, um, or promoting it uh, stopped because uh, they couldn't um, they couldn't come together uh, on the facts of uh, how citizens are actually being uh, pushed into the logics of uh, of one company uh, and uh, yeah the, the goals of one company and uh, to the the idea to uh, have very good employees there um, to, to attract only the residents that are useful for the company. And even though there have been diversity concepts, um, the, the city of Toronto then was not convinced and there was a, a strong um, strong protest movement, uh, also digital uh, protest movement um, around this whole project. and. Uh, I think, yes, of course, you have uh, social fragmentation and you have inequality in, in today's cities. Um, but what would be um, what would be worsened uh, is when you have the um, the coded uh, or the programmed uh, technology that is monitoring to maintain uh, this particular structure of the population and which is uh, which is monitoring and surveying if the city is running as expected and and hence uh, if it runs as expected as is by default excluding certain people um, fr from uh, living there and I think that is what social fragmentation means here as a risk. Uh, it doesn't mean that it has not been there before but it would uh, worsen the situation or um, make it uh, less um, less easy or, or uh, yeah make it harder to overcome um, and to improve uh, the situation.